Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's presentation, The Nature of Oaks with Doug Tallamy. Um, a few remarks uh, before I introduce our speaker this evening. I want to take a moment and thank our sponsors. Returning now for a third year as the series presenting sponsor for the Wolf of Restoration series is Brother International. Thank you to Vicki and all the wonderful folks there at Brother. I'd um, also like to recognize International Paper, who has been our longtime sponsor of the Tree Planting Event Day. Uh, so both of those companies, uh, we really appreciate their involvement and their help volunteerism-wise and otherwise. We also want to thank our other 2022 benefactors, AutoZone, Bank of America, Buckman, Crawford Howard Family Foundation, FedEx, Hyde Family Foundations, International Paper, Ring Container Technologies, and Silvano, all for their ongoing support. All of our supporters, corporations, community organizations, individual donors and volunteers are all critically important in allowing us to deliver on our mission. The protection and enhancement of the Wolf River watershed as a sustainable natural resource. As always, a gift of any size is appreciated. Please look in the chat box for the donation link and donate tonight if you can. A few housekeeping details. We ask that you not try to uh, record this program any, with any device. Uh, also, when you have questions during the program, please use the Q&A feature, not the chat box feature. Our education director, Kathy, will monitor the chat box and your questions at the end of the pro and answer your questions at the end of the program. Um, this recording will be available after tonight on our website. So just to let you know that as well. It is now my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Doug Tallamy. Doug is the T.A. Baker Professor of Agriculture in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware, where he has authored 106 research, publication, research publications and has taught insect-related courses for 41 years. Chief among his research goals is to better understand the many ways insects interact with plants and how such interactions determine the diversity of animal communities. His book, Bringing Nature Home, was published by Timber Press in 2007. The Living Landscape, co-authored by Rick Dark, was published in 2014. Nature's Best Hope, a New York Times bestseller, was released in February 2020. And his latest book, The Nature of Oaks, was released by Timber Press in March 2021. In 2021, he co-founded Homegrown National Park with Michelle Alfandre. His awards include recognition from the Garden Writers Association, Audubon, the National Wildlife Federation, the Garden Club of America, and the American Horticultural Association. Doug, thank you for being with us tonight, and I will now turn it over to you. Thanks so much. Well, thank you, Mark. Let me screen share. Here we go. It is a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, I always like talking about oaks, my favorite plants. And what we're going to do is, is talk a little bit about oaks, but a lot more about the living things that depend on oaks. That's why I call it the nature of oaks. And we're going to start by looking at oaks uh, that we planted in our yard, Cindy and I, when we moved in to our new house. This is what it looked like. And uh, it was a farm that was broken up in Oxford, Pennsylvania moved in in the year 2000. It was a very old farm, been farm almost 300 years, and uh, the soil was e exhausted. And the last thing they did before they, they broke it up was to mow it for hay. So very, very few woody plants there at all. Uh, and we moved in in July, but uh, that September, there was, uh, I don't think it was an oak mast, but some uh, acorns dropped from white oak trees about a mile and a half down the, the the road and we got some of those acorns and planted them. Of course, white oak groups, uh, acorns germinate in the fall. They send down a radical, a root, and that's all they do in the fall. But in the spring, they put up their first leaves and that's all they do in the spring, or at least that's what it looks like. Uh, so this is, this is one of the things that gives oaks a reputation of growing very slowly. When they're very young, it looks like they are growing slowly. But in fact, the first year, they're putting out 10 times more root biomass than leaf biomass. So they are growing, but most of that growth occurs underground and we can't see it. So here's our oak in, in year two. I've got a deer cage around it. 
because it wouldn't be there if I didn't. And we're gonna follow what happens on this tree. This is what it looked like 18 years later. It was 45 feet tall, 47 inch circumference, a canopy spread of 30 feet, still a baby of course, but it's a real landscape tree. One of the themes for tonight is that oaks support an awful lot of creatures. There are dozens of species of birds that depend on oaks, um, a number of mammals, including rodents, the big guys too, bears and the, the very big oaks will live in the hollow spaces, raccoons, possums, not that many reptiles depend on oaks, but there are several butterfly species that uh, specialize on oaks, hundreds of species of moths that depend on them, as well as all their predators and parasitoids. We'll talk about sinipid gall wasps, lots of them on oaks, and many beetles, June beetles, longhorn beetles, metallic wood boring beetles, weevils, and others. Uh, lots of spiders are associated with, with oaks, and then dozens more species of arthropods, mollusks, and annelids annelids depend on what's happening underneath the oak tree. So we have a very diverse web of life, but it typically goes unnoticed uh, by people who have oaks in their yards. Uh, and if it's unnoticed, then it's also unappreciated. And that's why I wrote this book, The Nature of Oaks. It is a month by month guide to the life that occurs on the oaks in your yard. My idea was that uh, if I provide the, the knowledge about what's happening on oaks, uh, that's likely to generate more interest in oaks and interest often leads to compassion. And we need a lot more compassion towards the natural world these days. So first a few facts, the genus Quercus contains 91 species in North America, 435 species globally. Uh, the word comes from the Celtic quer, meaning fine and quez meaning tree. So oaks are indeed fine trees. There are four major taxonomic sections in the genus in North America. There's the Quercus group, the white oak group, the Lobate group, which is the red oak group. Varentes is the live oak group, and then a much smaller group, the canyon oak group called Protobalanus in the West. This is the distribution of oaks in the US. Uh, there is at least one oak species in every area except the brown here. So when you get up in particularly the northern rocky areas or where the, the very dry high plains uh, oaks drop out. But within the U.S., the center of distribution is right here. Tennessee is right there in the thick of it with uh, a number of oak species. But Mexico puts us all to shame. There's 128 species of oaks in, in Mexico alone. Oaks live a long time. 900 year average life cycle when all things go well. That's 300 years of growth, 300 years of stasis and 300 years of decline. And during each one of those periods of growth, um, they're delivering unique ecological uh, benefits to the landscape around them. So when you hear somebody say, I've got a hundred year oak in my, my yard, the implication is that's a very old oak. It's still a baby. Why don't they live? 900 years most of the time, it's because that very large root system gets interrupted someplace. It bangs into a road or a sewer, sewer line or a pipeline or a, a cellar way. So we interfere and that's why they don't typically live that long. Uh, the oldest oak in the country is thought to be the Middleton Oak. It's a Southern live oak in Charleston, 1500 years old. But if you really wanna look at the oldest oak, you have to go to the Palmer Oaks in California. Uh, they're small, they're, they look like ground covers. You wouldn't recognize them as oaks at all, but they kind of creep along the ground and, and clone themselves. So it roots here, and then uh, after a long period, roots over here, and this portion dies, and it just keeps going. This individual has been dated at 13,000 years old. So the Palmer Oak's one of the oldest living things on the planet. Oaks can be large. This is the Y Oak in Y, Maryland. Uh, it's no longer with us, but it was the largest white oak in the country. Uh, and it was, it was huge. I, I got to see it before it fell over in a hurricane. But another point I wanna make tonight is that we have small oaks as well. Uh, so even if you have a small landscape, you can plant an oak. And then finally, we're gonna talk about their superior ecological function. They have the highest biodiversity value, meaning they're supporting more species than other trees. They're sequestering more carbon dioxide, extremely important uh, today, pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and building their tissues out of, out of the carbon. Uh, and then even just as importantly, they're pumping carbon into the ground through their root systems for long-term storage. Uh, they do have those large root systems, so they're one of the best soil stabilizers that are out there. They make uh, the best leaf litter, and I say it's the best because it lasts the longest. A single oak leaf can take up to three years to break down. Uh, and we'll talk about what leaf litter does. And then all of that promotes healthier watersheds. So I started the book in October. 
And people always say, well, why did you start in October? Because that's when my, my wife said, you should write a book about oaks. And I said, yes, dear. No, she's, she's very sweet. Um, why not start in October? I looked out my window and, and that's what our tree looked like. Uh, and October, of course, is, is when you start noticing acorns the most. Now they're on the tree for months before that, but we typically don't really notice them until they start to drop from the tree. And a single oak can make a lot of acorns, up to 3 million acorns in its lifetime. And each one of those is a very rich package of food. It's very rich in fats, very rich in proteins. And because of that, uh, it's an important food source for an awful lot of animals. Again, those rodents really, really like uh, acorns, but the big guys depend on them as well. Uh, of course, our squirrels, we know they like acorns and those cute little deer, they love acorns too. A number of birds depend on acorns. Turkeys, for example, will scour the, the woods all fall eating every or acorn they can. red belly woodpeckers, titmice, towhees, uh, nuthatches, flickers, all of these guys are eating lots of acorns. And ducks, particularly wood ducks, they really love acorns. Any acorn that falls into the, the water, a stream or a lake, the wood duck will dive down and get it or they'll come right up on the shore and eat acorns all day long. Number of invertebrates depend on acorns as well. This is the acorn weevil tunneling out of an acorn. That's what the adult looks like. It can be really common in, in acorns. Uh, and then here's an acorn moth. It's actually a, a species complex. They all look the same, so it's hard to tell them apart, but the caterpillar develops in acorns and then the, the moth leaves the acorn. So if you look under an oak tree, maybe two weeks after the acorns fall, it's utter destruction. There's, there's, there's hardly a viable acorn there um, because of all these things that depend on them. And you might wonder how oaks ever successfully reproduce. And this is where a very ancient mutualism between jays and, and oaks comes to the rescue. Both jays and oaks uh, appeared in Southeast Asia about the same time, about 65 million years ago. That's where they originated. And right away, they formed a, a mutualistic relationship with each other. Oaks are producing the acorns that jays depend on for winter food, but jays in turn allow oaks to move farther and faster than any other tree genus in the world. And this is how that works. Jays, of course, are storing acorns for winter food. They don't cache them. Now they can carry more acorns, more than one acorn at a time, but they only bury them, uh, a single acorn in, a, in one spot at, at a time. So they're not, they're not caching them with a bunch of acorns in a, uh, one place. And what they do is they'll pick up an acorn and then they'll fly up to a mile. And that's the key, that is farther, that farther than any other organism carries acorns from the parent tree. They'll find a disturbed, place where the soil has been disturbed and it's easy to poke that acorn underground and that's what they will do. Now if they think another jay has watched them stick the acorn underground, they will hang around for a little bit. Then they'll dig up their acorn and move it to a new spot because jays know that jays steal acorns. And then of course during the winter time uh, they're going to go to those spots and dig up the acorn and have something to eat. Well, a single jay can bury up to 4,500 acorns each fall. They work very hard. That is a lot of acorns. But they only remember where one out of every four acorns is, which means a single jay can actually plant 3,360 oak trees each year. And if they do it up to a mile from the parent tree, that's what allowed those oaks to move faster. And by move, I mean disperse. When, you know, when the glaciers came down and pushed uh, not just oaks, but everything down right to the Gulf Coast or even into... Mexico, um, as they receded, the plants moved north, but oaks led the way because jays were dispersing their acorns farther than other types of seeds. It's not just blue jays that are doing this. All the species of jays in North America, actually all the species of jays all over the world in Europe and, and Central America are moving acorns around. This is a scrub jay in uh, Oregon doing that. Uh, so that's, that's a relationship common to the entire lineage. And jays are not the only birds that have a close relationship with acorns. This is the acorn woodpecker in the southwest. It's a very beautiful bird. Uh, they do also store acorns for winter use, but they don't bury them underground. What they do is they find a dead tree, a snag, and they, they poke holes in it. They drill holes in it, and then they store the acorns in those holes uh, for, for uh, the entire winter, and then they'll eat them as they need them. Uh, now it takes a lot of work to drill acorn holes like this. So a jay family 
will work together to protect their acorn tree. Uh, and they stick their acorns in there. But uh, over the years, they can drill up to 50,000 holes in a single tree, a single snag. So that's worth protecting. They don't want to have to do that more than once. So if you have a, a, an acorn tree in your yard, it, it is enormously entertaining. Okay, November is when you might uh, recognize that it was either a good year for acorns or not such a good year. And if it's a good year, we call that a mast year. Usually within a single taxonomic group, like the white oak group or the red oak group, uh, several species will produce their acorns at the same time. And they do it in great numbers. Uh, and then other years, they produce very few. So that really asynchronous uh, production of, of seed is unusual in plants and it needs to be explained. Well, that's what ecologists do. They try to explain things. So there are four hypotheses that have been offered to explain why oaks mass the way they do. They're not mutually exclusive. They all could be happening at the same time. Predator satiation, predator reduction, improved pollination and energy partitioning. Let's look at each one of those. Predator satiation. This is an acorn weevil larva outside the acorn. Again, they can be really common in acorns. Up to 90% of the acorns can have an acorn weevil in it. And that's the same, same thing for acorn moths. They can be really common in there. It's the same thing for the white-footed mice and the other rodents that depend on acorns and the squirrels and the deer. All these things are eating acorns. So if oaks produce the same number of acorns every year, the populations of those acorn predators would stabilize around that number. And they'd eat almost every single one. But if folks are really variable in when they make their, their acorns, uh, that actually reduces predator populations every now and then. So if you have an, a, a mass year one year, uh, the acorn weevils will explode and the acorn moths will explode and the squirrels will do really well and you'll get a lot of white-footed mice. But then the next year, there's very few acorns. So all those populations crash. You do have starvation. It reduces the number of, of acorn predators that are out there. And you often go several years with very few acorns. And then another mast year. And when that mast year comes, there are not enough squirrels, not enough mice, not enough uh, acorn weevils to kill all the acorns. Improved pollination. Oaks are wind pollinated which is a game of chance. These are the, the male catkins. They simply release pollen on the wind and that pollen has to uh, not only find a female flower, but it has to find a female flower on a different tree. Um, and again, that is a game of chance. If, if you have pollen, a lot of pollen released at the same time from different trees, the chance of successful pollination improves. And then finally, energy allocation. And by the way, if you're wondering whether oaks can have good fall color, they can. This is a scarlet oak. It's got one of the best. Well, energy allocation. There's, there's almost never enough energy to go around. So oaks partition it. In one year, they'll use it for growth. In another year, they'll use it for, for acorn production. But rarely do they do both at the same time. I mean, they'll always grow a little bit. But sometimes they grow a lot. And sometimes they grow very little. Now, remember, those four hypotheses are not mutually exclusive. They all could be contributing to the selection for oak masting. December is when you might recognize another unusual trait about oaks, and that is that particularly in the white oak group, they don't drop their leaves. That is a condition called marcescence, where you have a deciduous, deciduous tree hanging on to the leaves all winter long. Certainly unusual behavior. So again, we've got to explain that. And the leading explanation is that it wasn't that long ago that uh, at least in the temperate zones, there were a lot of huge mammals uh, roaming the earth. This is just the group of large mammals that was in Mexico alone. Uh, three species of mammoths, the giant sloth that could reach up 18 feet, camels, horses. You know, the, the earth had something like 44 species of rhinoceros uh, before we came and wiped them all out. But a lot of these guys were, were browsers, like a white-tailed deer. White-tailed deer is a browser. Uh, it's not that they're eating the grass in your yard. It is, it is particularly in wintertime, it is depending on woody material particularly the buds that will, will burst forth in the spring and create new foliage. That's where all the nutrients is, is in the buds of woody material. And that's what white-tailed deer are eating all winter long. And these guys did as, as well. So the thinking is that the oaks surrounded their, their buds with dead leaves. They held onto those dead leaves, which meant it was difficult to get at the buds without getting a mouthful of untasty 
uh, dead leaves that also made a lot of noise and attracted uh, the predators of these guys. And the distribution of these, these leaves supports that hypothesis. It's the lower branches that uh, are marcescent. When you get above 18 feet up here, there is no more marcescence. And that was higher than those mammals could, could actually reach. Uh, so, you know, difficult to prove at this point, but it certainly makes a nice story. And the fact that uh, the white oak group is marcescent means it gives oaks a landscape trait that other deciduous trees don't have. They hang onto their leaves and can be used as screens even in the wintertime. So if you don't like your neighbor, you can plant a, a white oak or a chestnut oak or a post oak uh, and actually screen them out all year round. Very handy trait. All right, January, it's cold, it's cold this year. Um, and most people are not out looking up in, in their oaks to see what's going on. But if you do go out and you stare up into your oak tree, uh, you might see little birds hopping around. And you probably won't think much about it. And the little birds are things like chickadees and tip mice. Of course, those are the birds that are our, at our feeder all winter long, eating seeds. And so we don't worry about them. We're feeding them. They're, they're good. But only half of their, their uh, diet is seeds in the wintertime. The other half is insects and spiders, even in the wintertime. But then we have, uh, we have things like the golden crown kinglet, which are smaller than chickadees. It's a tiny little bird and they don't eat seeds. They're not at our feeders. Uh, they are entirely insectivorous. This is the type of bird that should have migrated to the south where there's always insects around, but it doesn't migrate. It migrates a little bit, but not down uh, very far. Uh, and it is up in the trees. I took this picture in my backyard when it was, was snowing. It's bouncing around those, those tree limbs as if it's hunting for food. Well, I'm an entomologist. I know there's no, there's no food up in the, the dead limbs in the middle of the winter time. So that, that forms the kinglet paradox. What is the kinglet doing here in the winter time? What's it jumping around my trees for when there's no food up there? Well, uh, Bern Heinrich doesn't like paradox, paradoxes. So he, uh, he's one of the wonder, wonderful naturalists who's, who's left. Um, he actually looked in kinglet crops in Maine in January, and he found that they were full of caterpillars in Maine in January. So they are actually finding insects up in the trees. Uh, who knew they were up there? If you look very closely, uh, they look like sticks. That's why we don't see them. They look a lot like sticks. Most of them are in the family Geometridae, the inchworms and they spend the entire winter sitting up there in the trees. So here's a caterpillar right here. It doesn't freeze because it's got antifreeze proteins in its cells that keep them from bursting when the temperatures uh, get below freezing. So it shrinks a little bit, and then when it gets warmer, it swells a little bit, but it's not, it's not eating all winter long and it just sits there. So, okay, there's no more kinglet paradox. We know what the kinglets are doing. We know what the chickadees and the tip mice are doing. They're eating these caterpillars all winter long. But we don't know what the caterpillars are doing up there. Uh, you know, why, if you're a caterpillar, why would you sit outside all winter long? Most insects overwinter as eggs and they have the adaptations to get through the cold weather or they overwinter as, as chrysalids or pupae and a few overwinter as adults, but very few overwinter as, as larvae. Uh, but think about it. Uh, one possible explanation is that when the leaves burst out in the spring, those larvae will, will be right there, ready to take advantage of it. If you're an egg, you've got to hatch out and you're a tiny little guy. You're not competitive with those big larvae. If you're an adult, you've got to find another adult and mate and then lay eggs. And so the larvae have a competitive advantage in getting those, those first leaves that, that uh, uh, burst forth in the spring over anything else that's out there. February. That's truly the quietest time of the year for oak. So right now we're in the quietest time of year. It's a good time to talk about what I call oak landscaping myths. There are several of them. Now, you know, myths are often built around something that has some, some degree of fact associated with it. At least they used to be. Uh, and, but I hear this all the time. Oaks are too expensive to use. They're gonna grow too slowly to use as landscape plants. I hear people say, you know, I'm not gonna plant an oak because I won't live long enough to enjoy it. They get too big to use on small lots. And if we do, they're going to fall over and crush our house, or they're going to lift up our hardscape, our sidewalk, our driveway. These are all reasons you hear why people don't want to plant an oak. So what's, what's fact or fiction? Are oaks too expensive to, to use? They can be. 
depending on whether you want instant gratification or not. And, and you know, so many of us do. We want to have a full-grown tree right away. Uh, and the bigger the plant, the bigger the tree you buy, the more it's going to cost you. And the bigger the tree you buy, the higher the chance that it's not going to make it. Uh, so you're paying a lot of money and you're taking a risk at the same time. And the, the ironic thing is, in the end, you are not speeding up the growth of that tree. So this is the way we grow large trees in a lot of places in pots. They're called air pots, I think, that prevent uh, root, root bound condition. Remember, oaks have big, big uh, root systems. So even though you can grow an oak in a, in a pot without it being root bound, it minimizes the, the amount of root uh, biomass, of root material that uh, this, this tree this size can, can support. So when you put it in the ground, the first thing it does is try to grow the full complement of roots that it needs to support a tree that big. And that can take many years. This is a root bound uh, tree. And, and you know, when you grow, grow big rooted plants in a pot, um, this can happen. You have to be very careful about this. So you can plant this tree and it will continue to grow and the roots will strangle the tree in it and it will die. So that's something you definitely want to avoid. Uh, it's something that the, the, the city of, of Newark, Delaware did not avoid here. I think there are 15 trees they planted a couple summers ago. And I drove by, I had to stop and take a picture because every single one died. They spent a lot of money to get their instant gratification. Something went drastically wrong. Well, the other option besides uh, growing them in pots is to have bald and burlap trees. But that means you're chopping the roots off and then wrapping it up in burlap and it looks very, very neat, but um, it, is, it is hard on the tree to lose, a tree this size to lose all of its root mass. So if I plant an acorn, the same day I plant one of these, and I actually did this at, at home, I wasn't thinking ahead, I did that by accident, um, but these trees, if they live, will spend the next decade trying to rebuild the root system to support the size of the tree that they are. This acorn will germinate, its root system will never be disturbed. And after the end of that decade, it will be bigger and healthier than the trees you just spent a lot of money on. So it's slow in the beginning, but if you can have a little, little patience, you will end up with a healthier tree in the end. Um, this is a terrible picture that, that I took with my cell phone. I guess the light was too low. Um, I, was in, uh, I was in Illinois not, not long ago, uh, and the people I was staying with told me this was a 40-year-old bald and burlap black oak. They had planted it, they bought it and planted it. It's got a big big rip in its bark here, so I'm not sure how long it's gonna live. But uh, it grew a little bit, but not all that much. Um, 30 years after they planted this, so just 10 years ago, a blue jay or a squirrel planted a white oak right next to it. They did not take it out. And that white oak is almost as big as the black oak now in just, just 10 years because it's got its full complement of roots and it will surpass this in short order. This is, the, this is an ideal size to plant your oaks. And of course, you don't usually find them in nurseries like this because the, <laughs> the nurseryman cannot charge you a lot of money for this. And I understand that. But if you really want a healthy plant, you wanna, you wanna plant your oak as small as possible. But when you plant them small, you know, do you, are, are they going to get big enough to enjoy your oak while you're still alive? And, you know, if you, if you can only enjoy your oak when it's 400 years old, then no, you, you're not going to see it mature. But if you can enjoy what your oak is doing for you, it can, it can uh, provide benefits for you right away. Let's have a race between, this is the white oak that we're following here in my yard, the one I planted from an acorn, and my little friend Bella. She's two years old here. Um, we ended up watching, this is not my daughter, we, we ended up watching uh, Bella, she was born on my wife's birthday, uh, and um, we watched her five days a week for a couple of years. So she became our, our surrogate granddaughter, and she loved this tree. Well, let's have a race. Who's going to win uh, the, the growth rate? Now, you, this is a white oak, you know white oaks grow really slowly, so Bella has a chance here. So here's the white oak at six years old, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, Bella is losing. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. There's 2020. Bella's got her mask on. She's through growing now. She is tall. She's 5'11. Uh, but 
not as tall as the tree. The tree uh, took off and now is growing at a, 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 you know, as fast as any other tree. So the notion that oaks grow so slow that you can't enjoy them is, is just false. You have to get through that slow period in the beginning, uh, but Bella couldn't beat the tree and, and you'll enjoy your tree too. And again, they will deliver ecological services right away. This is a pin oak that has popped above the leaves in my yard. And here's a caterpillar standing on the ground eating the leaves of that oak. This is not a bad thing. This is a good thing because a bird's gonna come and eat this caterpillar. So this oak tree, even though it's the first year of its growth, has supplied food for a bird. And it will do that over and over again throughout its life. Are oaks too large to use in small yards? Uh, well, you're not going to find a landscape designer or a landscape architect anywhere who suggests that you put an oak this size in a yard this small. But people used to do that, and it's still working out for a whole street here in, in the city of, of Newark, Delaware again. I'm pretty sure these red oaks were planted the same, same time this house was built, which is more than 100 years ago. Uh, remember, 100 years ago, there was no air conditioning, so the oaks have been lowering the temperature, the summer temperature of these houses for by 10 degrees for decades. Very, very uh, nice ecosystem service. They haven't lifted up the hardscape. They haven't fallen over and crushed the house. Uh, but again, nobody's going to recommend rec that you put an oak this size in a, a size uh, plot that small. This is a large oak next to a large church. Um, but luckily, they didn't chop the, the oak down. It's still there. Everybody's happy. It's an, an, it's an exception. Um, they used to do it. They're not going to not going to do that anymore. Point I want to make here is that we have small options. Um, we have more small options in the west uh, than we do in the east, but in the east, Quercus prinoides is a, a very common one. It's in the marketplace most of the time. Dwarf chestnut oak produces acorns when it's five feet tall. Um, it gets up around 15 feet tall, and that, that's about it. The Georgia oak uh, is in the trade now and then. It's a very small oak. It's actually almost endangered in the in the wild. Um, blue blue jack oaks, black jack oaks, <clears throat> Chapman oak. There's a number. There's a dwarf live oak, Quercus virginiana minima, that can be used in our eastern landscapes. So and and all these yellow species here are uh, small oaks that occurred in Texas alone. So there are small options. We have to get more of them into the trade. Uh, and and as, as people start to ask for oaks more and more, I'm sure that that will happen. Here's my dwarf chestnut oak in my yard, making acorns again when it's five feet, five feet tall. Another option is to make oak coppices. Now, I don't know if anybody is doing this. I found this picture on the, on the web, but it's, I think it's a wonderful idea. Coppice, of course, is when you take a tree that's maybe three, four inches in diameter and cut it off at the base, and it will come back as a shrub. And it eventually to form another leader. You can cut it off again. You can coppice something for hundreds of years. You end up with the benefits of oak foliage in your yard in a very small space. So it's an option. I'd love to see people try it. But if you put oaks in your yard, are they going to fall over and, and crush your, your house? When they do, you hear about it on the news. You know, in the news, you only hear about bad news. And, and so wherever a storm is, it blows a tree over you hear about it. And it does happen, of course. But the reason it happens is because of the way we plant our trees. We plant them all as specimen plants. We want them to, to attain their full size without any competition from another tree. So we, we separate them to the point where they can't interlock their root systems with each other. And then yet, particularly in, in very wet periods with wind, pew, over they go. This is the way trees grow in the woods. Uh, they they're grow close enough that their roots uh, form a very stable matrix, uh, and it's very difficult to blow over. Here's a stream cut near my house uh, where you've got one, two, three, four trees all interlocked together. Nothing's going to blow these trees over. A tornado will, will snap them off, but there's no landscaping trick that's going to save you from, from tornadoes. So instead of this, let's consider making I call them oak groves or tree groves where you plant more than one close together. Here are the trees we got our original white oak acorns from down the street. Uh, that's about three feet from each other. Uh, nobody planted these. They planted themselves or the Blue Jays planted them before this road was put in, uh, but they're very stable. Nothing has blown them over. Neither one is as big as it would be if it had grown in isolation, but it's still there. Here are three uh, red oaks in, in uh, Northwest Connecticut, they're called the Three Sisters, again, growing very close to each other. 
Uh, and here's, here is a planned landscape at Mount Cuba Center in Hocassin, Delaware. It's one of the DuPont estates dedicated to native plants. So here we have a uh, big red oak in the background. These are hemlocks. Uh, these are big rhododendrons uh, down here and, and some hardscape. It is a planned landscape that takes up a good amount of space. It looks like it's natural, but it's very stable. All of these things are interlocking their roots with, with the other species. So it doesn't have to be the same species you put next to each other. It forms very good habitat, um, good screen. If you have acres of lawn someplace and you're wondering what, you know, can I reduce the, the acreage in lawn? This is a great way to do it. Create a tree grove where the trees are closer together than you might plant them if you're looking for a specimen tree. Our oak's gonna lift up your hardscape. Well, again, they can, depending on what you plant them over. If you plant an oak over bedrock, its roots are gonna go laterally and it'll lift up what's ever there. This is a pin oak. It's, it's you know, quickest palustris, the oak of the swamp. Um, but it's got enough space here. Its roots easily went underneath this, this uh, road here, no problem at all. These are two red oaks at the University of Delaware. They are big trees right next to the curb, no problem. So when you plant them uh, over enough soil so that they can dive deep, they, they do, most species. You don't wanna plant a willow oak, which is more a tree of the south. Those, those roots really do like to go uh, very shallow. But most oak trees uh, send roots down. It is not a given that they will lift up your hardscape. Another thing you want to watch out for, though, is uh, if you know you are planting over agricultural pan. Now, pan is it was established when your plot of land was plowed for maybe 100 years. The plow went down maybe 15 inches, and below that, it compacted the soil almost as if it's, if it's like bedrock. So the roots go laterally along that pan, and that can lift up hardscape. So if you know you have agricultural pan, break it up with a pickaxe or something, try to get it loosened up, and then the roots will go deep. March is when those leaves start to fall for the first time. They've been marcescent all, all winter long, but now they're gonna fall and start to, to perform their role on the ground as leaf litter. We shouldn't call it litter. We should call it, somebody suggested we call it leaf largesse because they're delivering so many important ecosystem services. Well, first of all, there's a lot of variation in the size and shape of oak leaves. Here's a live oak leaf. Here's a red oak juvenile, red oak adult, white oak, chestnut oak, this is an emery oak from Arizona, looks like a holly, willow oak, tremendous amount of, of variation uh, among oak leaves. And a big oak tree will make a lot of leaves, up to 700,000 leaves on that tree that each year fall. And if you line them all up next to each other in a tennis court, it would cover four tennis courts. And that's their job, it's to cover the ground. That's, that's one of their two jobs. They wanna cover the ground and protect the soil community, which is vital to all the plants on your, your property. And they also wanna return the nutrients to the soil so the tree can take it up when it grows in future years. I call oaks the oak leaves the best leaf litter because they do last up to three years and that means they're protecting the soil longer than other trees do. So leaf litter from uh, maple trees or birch trees or tulip trees, they don't make it through a single season. And then you've got bare soil and bare soil destroys the soil community. Everything that lives in the soil community depends on high humidity. Uh, so leaf litter protects that, that humidity. It protects the soil from the sun uh, drying it out. It protects the, the soil from erosion, either by wind or by water. There are more species that live underground than above the ground, and they are turning over the nutrients in the leaf litter so that they can be used by the tree again. They're called detritivores, eating that detritus. And if you're worried that your leaf litter is gonna block the growth of plants in your beds, uh, we worry too much about that. Now, if, if you rake all the, the leaves uh, into your bed so that you've got five feet of leaves, yes, it'll block the, the plants, but a normal layer of leaf litter uh, will not do that. And here's a, a fern bank that has come up right through those leaves. Naturally, nobody planted this. Um, so yours will as well. If you look at a single square meter of, of um, the humus layer underneath the leaf litter in your, under your oak tree, there's a lot of things there. 250,000 mites per square meter, 100,000 springtails, things like this little smintherid, uh, columbolin. 90,000 proturans. Proturans are very primitive insects, little teeny white things that you need a microscope to see. Uh, a million nematodes. It is teeming with life, but they're all tiny and they're all 
detritivores turning over that, that nutrients, performing really important roles. Of course, the fungi, the meta, meta, um, you know what I'm trying to say. That fungi, fungus is really important in, in terms of uh, helping your roots absorb nutrients. All live down there under the leaf litter <clears throat> and we've got to protect that soil community. A lot of uh, pretty butterflies, <coughs> excuse me, depend on leaf litter as well. This is the banded hair streak. It's caterpillars eat this stuff, dead oak leaves. Very tough to find the caterpillar, but the adult uh, butterfly is pretty common. If you rake the leaves away, you've raked away the food for that, that butterfly. You've raked away the nutrients for your tree. Um, and if you do that year after year, you have no butterflies and pretty soon your tree dies. Uh, the leaf litter is also a place where 70 species of moths, we call them litter moths, live. Where the, again, the caterpillars eat dead leaves. Things like the ambiguous litter moth, the American idea, the dark spotted palthus, all living in leaf litter on the ground. And again, when you rake it away and throw it away, you're throwing away all these things. When you watch your white-footed, your white-throated sparrows or your towhees or other ground birds, it looks like they're doing a dance on the ground. They're, they're shuffling, they're pushing leaves back. What they're doing is exposing the things that live in that leaf litter so that they can get a good meal. Those birds depend on leaf litter. So again, we don't want to rake it all away. And of course, then you have the, the entire natural enemy community that lives in our leaf litter. Many species of ground beetles and spiders and centipedes and millipedes, they're all down there. Okay, April is when uh, buds birth, burst forth. That's when you get the, the first um, opening up of the buds. And it is the time where you have a chance to see one of the most ephemeral interactions in all of nature it takes about five minutes each year. You got to be in the right place at the right time. But I'm talking about when cynipid gall wasps lay their eggs in the buds of galls. So here's a cynipid female. That's her ovipositor right there. And she's injecting an egg into the bud of a white oak at my house. This is a male cynipid. He is riding her. He has already mated with her, so the egg she injects is, will have been fathered by, by him. Uh, but he's still there because he'll be, she will allow him to mate with her again before she lays another egg, and he wants to be there to do that. This is a male who wishes he was this male, and he may try to be that male later on. So here she is. She's laying an egg, injecting the egg into the bud of the, of the oak. But at the same time, she's injecting plant hormones that will direct the cells in this bud, direct how they grow. The cells in a bud are, they're meristematic cells. They're, they're like stem cells. They're undifferentiated and they can be manipulated in a number of different ways. So you have the cynipid injecting plant hormones and you have the plant hormones that are already there. And the gall that results is a compromise between those two selective forces. People say that, that galls are like cancerous growths. And I don't like that analogy because cancerous growths are uncontrolled growth. They just keep growing and growing and growing. Galls are highly controlled uh, growth to the point where every single gall can be recognized as specific species. It comes from a particular species of cynipid. Here's a, uh, a different species of, of cynipid laying an egg in one of my uh, oak buds this past spring, and that is the gall that resulted from her of a position. A lot of gallers out there, a lot of cynipids, 5,000 species globally that are associated with, with oaks. A single oak tree can have up to 70 species of, of gallers on it. So I, it's hard to find an oak that doesn't have a gall on it. Most galls, or at least the big ones, are typically hollow. Uh, which is curious. This is the opal, apple oak gall or the oak apple gall. I've seen it written both ways. And if you cut it open, it's mostly hollow. The galler itself is in a cylindrical uh, cylinder right in the middle of the gall. Uh, it's hiding in there. That's where it's developing. Then you have a bunch of air and then you've got the outside of the gall. So the question is, what's this hair all about? Why is the gall so big? Why isn't it just surrounding where the galler actually is? And the answer is that um, cynipids have more natural enemies, more species of parasitoids, things like this terimid wasp that are laying their eggs in them. So more species of natural enemies that are attacking cynipids than any other type of insect. Uh, so it's a tremendous selection pressure that helps shape the size of those galls. The distance between the galler itself in the center of that gall and the outside of the gall has to be bigger than the ovipositor 
of the natural enemies. Uh, there's a period in the beginning when the gall is just growing where the, the uh, pterymid wasp can reach the galler with their ovipositors, and that's when most of them do, but very rapidly the gall gets so big that then the galler is protected from the natural enemies. So that is what that big space is all about. Here's a pterymid from the west coast, Pterymus californicus, which has the longest ovipositor of all the pterymids. And it has resulted in the largest gall that we have in, in North America. It's on Quercus gariana, the Oregon oak. Uh, it's got to be bigger to uh, allow the, the uh, galler to escape that long, very long ovipositor from the pterymid. A lot of, lot of variation in, in gall shape and size. Uh, some of them are quite pretty. Some of them look like, uh, like plant diseases. Many of them do actually. There are 536 species of plant galls west of the Rockies and many of them are cynipids. Most of them are cynipids and most of them are on oaks. So some of them make galls on the leaves themselves. Some make galls on, on the stems. Some look like candy. Some look like that. Some look like plant diseases. Some look like spindles, some look again, you know, they're just crazy variation, more candy. Um, this is one that looks like pottery, it's in, in my yard. Uh, this is the, I've got to find this in real life. This is uh, from the West Coast, looks like a little Lenome house there. Uh, this guy looks like a brain, it's at my house as well. This is a really curious gall. There are four galls here on a single oak leaf. And this is after the gallers have emerged. So a single gall here can produce I don't know, 70, 80, 80 gallers. And a single leaf is producing several hundred gallers. So a really productive leaf. And galls have an interesting, uh, played an interesting role in human history in that they have provided the ink with which human history is written down. When you grind up a gall like this, and the hole there is where the galler uh, emerged, and combine it with certain chemicals, it creates an indelible black ink. And that is the ink that human history was recorded with. The Bible was written with gall ink. The Magna Carta was written with gall ink. The Declaration of Independence was written with gall ink. All of the writings of the monks and scribes in the Middle Ages were written with gall ink. Okay, May is when the leaves really do start to expand, uh, not just uh, on, on oaks, but of course, everything in the temperate zone. And following the, the expansion of those leaves comes the caterpillars that eat those leaves. And following the caterpillars that eat those leaves come the birds that eat the caterpillars. It is not a coincidence that our migrating birds move up into the temperate zone when there's a lot of caterpillars to eat. Remember, in the spring, there aren't any berries, there aren't any seeds. Of course, these birds are insectivores anyway. Uh, because the plants haven't made them yet. So what is fueling the migration is insects, largely caterpillars. And once they get to where they're going, again, that's what's fueling reproduction. Birders all over the place know that if you want to see warblers in the spring, you go to an oak uh, because that's where the warblers are. Why? Because that's where the food is. I had a, a student, Christy Beal, a number of years ago, look at the amount of minutes that warblers foraged on different different trees. This is tree families on the x-axis here. And the first bar here is Phagaceae. That's the, the family that oaks are in. Oaks, chestnuts, and beeches. Uh, well, there weren't any chestnuts and beeches in her sample size. So all of the warbler foraging here was on oaks. And it was much more than on pines or on birches and, and so on. And again, they are there because that's where those caterpillars are that, that fuel their, their migration. They can't fly on until they eat a bunch of caterpillars and rebuild the fat that they have burned up in their last flight. So things like the purple crested slug, the buck moth, the white marked tussock moth, the saddle prominent, double line prominent, white dotted prominent, the checkered fringe prominent, the laugher, the lace cap caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the skiff moth, the white blotched heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the red, uh, the variable oak leaf caterpillar. This is the banded uh, tussock moth. There's the red line panopoda, the uh, yellow neck caterpillar, the smaller parasa, the unicorn caterpillar, the crown slug, the streak dagger moth, the epilated dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the red humped oak worm, the orange humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the confused wood grain, the spiny oak slug, and my favorite, the spun glass slug, and then literally hundreds more species of moths are on the oaks in any one given place. 
Now we put, this is our, the same house you saw earlier. We put most of the plants back, got a little bit of lawn here. So we're very traditional. The oak that we're following is over here. You can't see it from where I'm standing, but um, our research has shown that caterpillars are the most important member of terrestrial food webs because they're transferring more energy from plants to other organisms than any other type of plant eater. So counting the number of caterpillars in your landscape, the number of caterpillar species, is going to tell you how healthy that food web is and how diverse your landscape is. That's what I've been doing for the last, it's probably five years now, taking pictures of the caterpillars at my house, and I'm up to 1,140 species of just moths in my yard. I haven't gotten to the butterflies yet. Point I want to make is um, two points. First of all, a lot of life comes back when you put the plants back, the native plants that support them. But 30% of this 1,140 are on the oaks in my yard. Uh, that's a huge percentage for a single genus of trees. And that's why I call oaks keystone species. Remember what a keystone is. This is the Roman arch. The keystone is the stone in the middle of that arch. And if you take that, that stone out of the arch, the arch collapses. Well, if you take keystone plants out of your local food web, the food web collapses. And that's because they're making most of the food. Why do we need so much caterpillar food? Um, well, again, I say it's driving food webs, but it's particularly important to birds during, during the breeding cycle. Uh, you've probably heard this statistic before, but Carolina chickadees take 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars required to make one clutch of Carolina chickadee just to the point where they, where they fledge it, when they leave the nest. And after they leave the nest, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars another 21 days. So it's really tens of thousands of caterpillars required to make one nest of a bird that's a third of an ounce, four pennies worth of bird. And they are not unusual. 96% of our birds require insects to reproduce and most of those insects are caterpillars. And oaks are making most of the caterpillars. Compared to, to uh, crepe myrtle, for example, you're not getting any caterpillars off of that. You're not getting any caterpillars off your privet, off of the, the uh, bush honeysuckle. All of those non-native plants that are everywhere uh, in Tennessee are not making the caterpillars that our breeding birds need. Oaks make more caterpillars, 950 species nationwide. 950 species of caterpillars supported by oaks nationwide. And no other tree genus comes close to that. Okay, let's move on to June. I call it cicada month. Um, I believe you folks had some cicadas this year. Um, we're talking about the periodical cicada. At my house, the 17-year brood came out uh, this June. There's also a 13-year year brood. Uh, and we talk about a brood, but there's actually three species in, in that brood. They all come out simultaneously. The periodical cicadas are... Uh, essentially orange and black compared to annual cicadas that are, that are essentially green and, and black. Well, we knew this was coming because it happens once every 17 years. So the media again has, has fun talking about how terrible everything's gonna be. They said, it's gonna be a terrible scourge. Uh, people are going to have to move because it's so loud. They won't be able to stand it. Mothers will kill their babies because they go crazy. It's an invasion. Every bad thing they could say about the, the uh, cicada emergence was said. But you know, to, to entomologists, this is, uh, Mike Raup calls it the entomologist Super Bowl. This is, this is one of the most fantastic biological events you'll ever have the privilege to, to witnessing. And it was a good one this year. Uh, this is an oak tree in front of uh, my building at the University of Delaware, had very good emergence. Once every 17 years. Now I'm 70 this year, so I won't see this again until I'm 87. So I made sure I took good advantage this time because who knows what's going to happen when I'm 87. When they emerge, they leave holes in the ground. They're aerating the soil. Now you can pay people to do this or you can have cicadas and they'll do it for you. It lets oxygen and water down to the roots. It's a very valuable benefit to the trees. And again, there were a lot of them. So many that 11 Mississippi kites flew up to Newark, Delaware to eat our cicadas. They stayed here for two weeks. It became a, a birding uh, uh, extravaganza. Everybody wanted to see the Mississippi kites. Um, I wanted to see the cicadas. This is a typical life cycle. The, the nymph has been sucking on xylem out of roots for 17 years. And then synchronously, they crawl out of the ground at night. They split their skin and... This is called an exuvii, and they swing up and hang onto the nose there, and then they hang. 
So right now they're like a soft shell crab. They're, anything can eat them now because their exoskeleton has not tanned and that's what they're doing. They're gonna hang there for a couple of hours during the night. They've got to do it at night because they're so vulnerable until they turn uh, hard and can actually fly away. And when they fly away, they'll, they'll go about their business, which is trying to find a mate and reproduce. This is a male cicada and he makes a buzzing sound with a structure in his thorax called a tympanum that uh, it functions like a clicking Coke can. If you click the Coke can, it goes click, 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 click. Well, they do it something like 400 times a second and it goes so fast that it, it forms a buzzing. Uh, and it's, it's pretty loud. He's trying to be loud because females judge him based on how loud he can, he can make his clicking sound. The idea is that uh, only big males, only healthy males are going to be able to make a, a very loud buzz. And of course, the female wants to mate with the healthiest male. So here's a female that decided he was, he was a good enough male and she is mating with him. And then she can go about her business in terms of laying eggs in, in twigs of trees. So here's a female ovipositing. That's her ovipositor there. She's laying in a, uh, a pin oak stem in my front yard. This is hard to do. Get a pin someday and try to stick it into the stem of a pin oak. Uh, you're going to bend the pin. It's really tough, but she does it somehow. She gets her ovipositor. She jams it in there and then lays an egg, then goes down, lays another egg and another egg and another egg. So you have a whole string of eggs down the stem, maybe seven or eight of them. Then she'll move to a different place. From the point where she lays those eggs out, the branch typically dies. That's called flagging. <clears throat> and this upsets a lot of people. Oh, they're going to kill my tree. They're not going to kill your tree, but they are going to prune it once every 17 years. And that's okay. Then the eggs hatch, the little guys fall to the ground, tunnel underneath the ground and start to suck on those plant roots. A single tree can have up to 50,000 nymphs on it with no measurable damage to the tree. And the reason that happens is they're sucking xylem, which is essentially water. There's almost no nutrients in xylem at all. And it's one of the reasons it takes them so long to develop. I had a student look at where the flagging was on, on trees um, in Newark, Delaware. And it, it was primarily, at least they did more flagging on oaks than other tree species. They, they preferred them the most. The green bars are the, are the oaks. And then they die. That's it, it takes about three weeks. All the fun is over. The media can, can stop saying all the bad things they say. Uh, but you might wonder why is it, why once every 17 years? Well, the, again, the hypothesis is the same one that we had for oak mass, predator satiation. There's a lot of things that eat these cicadas. Uh, and if the cicadas come out in constant numbers every year, the predators might eat all of them. But if they, if they come out, there's no, no population of squirrels or birds or anything else that can, can become numerous enough to eat all the cicadas that come out once every 17 years. Their populations are based on the amount of food that is there during the 17 years that these guys are underground. So it's easy to swamp the predators when you do it that way. July, this is when uh, what I call the night chorus begins. And I'm talking about when Katie did start to sing. Uh, it's the male singing again. They raise their wings and, and rub them back and forth on each other. There's a structure here called a scraper and a file, and it makes a characteristic sound. I did a lot of camping in, in uh, North Jersey when I was young, and the Katie did used to sing me to sleep at night. It was, it was a wonderful sound. Uh, why are the males singing? Well, this is why. Once upon a time, there was a young woman named Katie, and she fell in love with a handsome young man. Alas, he did not share her feelings, and he married another. Soon thereafter, he and his young bride were found poisoned in their bed. Who perpetrated the crime was never determined, but some say the insects in the trees were watching that night, and each summer they solved the mystery by singing, Katie did, Katie did. So that's the sound of one male singing when you have a whole population of them singing. Um, it makes that night night chorus. There are four species of katydids that frequent oak forests. This is a uh, female that is not mature yet. She hasn't expanded her wings, but she's got her ovipositor ready to go. And here she is with her fully expanded wings. Why are they so loud? The same reason. These females prefer the loudest males. It's a signal of how healthy that male is. And when they find the loudest male, they mate with them. Then they will lay their eggs, glue them to the side of twigs, 
uh, and they're big flat eggs. So people always wonder what they are. These guys have already hatched. So the baby KD dead has come out. They spend most of their time in the canopy of the, the tree. So we don't see them that much, but we certainly do hear them. Katie Dids will sing from mid-July uh, all the way through July, through August, into September, sometimes even October when it's a long time if, if the first frost is delayed. Speaking of August, August is, is the time that it is really tough uh, for a caterpillar or other things to eat oak leaves because oak leaves have been getting tougher every day since they emerged in the spring. They're filled with tannins, they're filled with lignin that make them as stiff as a board. But there are ways that caterpillars get around that. And one of them is to feed gregariously. This is the yellow net caterpillar. By gregariously, I mean they're all eating alike at the same, same place, same time. And apparently a lot of mouths can get through that tough, tough leaf material easier than, than one. Uh, this is also the yellow net caterpillar when it's in its last instar, it's almost finished growing. Uh, and they can go through a lot of, of oak leaf material. Common trait, this is the uh, orange humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, they're all gregarious. It's a way to get around those tough August leaves. This is the oak that we're following in 2014. I walked around the bottom uh, of the tree here and counted the caterpillars just at head height as I walked around the tree. And I did it on July 24th, I think, of 2014. I found 410 caterpillars just on these lower branches. Then I stepped back and took a picture that you see here. Can you see any of those caterpillars? No. Can you see any of the caterpillar damage? No. But that's okay, because this is the distance at which we typically we view our trees. But if I knocked on your door and said, you got 410 caterpillars on your, your tree, ah, get the spray can, call the man, save the tree. I counted 115 yellow neck caterpillars as, as part of that 415, and they're pretty big. They had eaten a fair amount of material, but we can't see it. You don't have to call the man or, or get the spray can. The tree is adapted to passing on part of its energy so that you have life in your yard. These caterpillars are bird food. And we wouldn't have the birds if our oaks weren't able to do that. I met a woman in, in New Orleans several years ago, Tammany Baumgarten, who says we should all take, we should all use the, the, the 10 step program. Take 10 steps back from your tree and all of your insect problems will disappear. And I think that's wonderful advice. Another way to get around the leaf toughness in August is to become a leaf miner. The toughness is in the, the outer layers, the cuticle, the epidermis, the palisade, uh, mesophyll, the parenchymal cells in the middle are still tender, and that's where the nutrients are. So if you're small enough that you can mine this area in here, you can make it. So here's the two kinds of mines uh, made by caterpillars. This is a serpentine mine. The egg was laid here, and the little guy ate, ate, ate. This black string here is. Um, that's actually, it's, it's poops, it's frass. So he puts them in the middle, eats all this material, and then pupates here. Does not eat very much leaf material at all. This is a blotch mine. He just goes around and around a circle and, and it makes a bigger and bigger blotch. That's the caterpillar right there. There it is, uh, backlet. And there it is with a really nice picture by Salvador Batanza. Um, doesn't look much like a caterpillar because of all those specialized adaptations to be really thin and really small. But when it comes out as an adult, it does look like a regular caterpillar. It's tiny, but it's, it's a, a caterpillar. It looks like a regular moth. This is one of the Camomeria species on, common on oak, the solitary oak leaf miner, gregarious oak leaf miner, oak tentiform leaf miner, all, all common on oaks. Okay, we are now in September, the last month that we're gonna talk about. And that's when you're gonna, gonna start hearing the crickets that we know about in the, in the fall, the black crickets on the ground, of course, if one gets in your house, it's, it's good luck. But there are crickets up on trees as well, bush crickets and tree crickets. They're usually yellowish or greenish, uh, and they're on our, our oaks, doing the same thing that the other guys are doing. The males are singing to try to attract females, and the females have the same criteria. They want to go to the biggest male. But these guys are smart. They will find a hole in the leaf, or they'll chew a hole at, so of the right size, stick their head through it, and then raise their wings and sing through that hole. Most of the leaves on a tree are slightly cup shaped like a parabola and it projects that sound farther and louder than if he sang on a flat surface. So he's essentially sending a false message to, to a female. He says, I'm a really big male and, and he's not actually. 
Can you imagine a male sending a false message to a female? Heavens. But you know, and then she comes and mates with him. It might not be such a bad idea though, because he may not be the biggest male, but he might be the smartest male. And that could be good enough. September is also a good time to see, to find walking sticks, which in most years are not common at all. But there are records, particularly in West Virginia, of walking sticks being so common that they actually cause a little defoliation. I've never seen anything close to that, but this is a species in, in Arizona. I found it on an emery oak. Of course, they're called walking sticks because they look like sticks and they walk. They have an interesting way of reproducing though. The females, they're, again, they're up in the canopy with those katydids, they just walk around and they will drop eggs to the forest floor. One egg today, one egg tomorrow. That egg will either hatch this year or next year, or maybe two years from now. It's called bet hedging. In case it's not a great year, uh, you, you hedge your bets by having the eggs hatch at different times. This, of course, is blood root. It's one of the spring ephemerals that makes pods. And inside that pod are these pretty little seeds with these white things on them. Those white things are called eliosomes. And it turns out they're really tasty for, to ants. So here's the seed, but here's the eliosome that is going to attract ants. The ant will pick up the seed and take it back to the nest, and then they'll eat the eliosome. They realize they can't eat the seed, so they will throw the seed in their garbage dump which is about an inch underground, it's part of the nest, uh, and that's a perfect place for that seed to germinate. Well, it turns out that, that uh, walking stick eggs look a lot like they've got an eliosome, and there could be some chemistry here that makes them smell like that. So the ants pick them up, carry them back to the nest, oh, there's nothing to eat, so they put them in the garbage dump, and it's a perfect place for those eggs to spend a very safe uh, uh, time period until they actually hatch. All right, we've talked about just some of the things that happen on, on oaks. Um, you know, so many things I, I could only just scratch the surface. So now let's talk about um, some of the problems that we have on planet Earth today. We're not going to dwell on it too much, but you know we've got a biodiversity crisis. You know we've got a, a climate change crisis. Two major crises, uh, but the biodiversity crisis doesn't get enough, it doesn't get enough press. And even if we had no climate change at all, we would still have a biodiversity crisis. We hear about uh, birds disappearing. We've lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. We've got global insect decline. Um, they're not disappearing. They're not just declining. We're killing them. That's why we have a problem. We're not sh sharing our human spaces with the life around us. And that's why the earth is now experiencing its sixth great extinction event. Why does that matter? Well, it matters because that's the life that runs the ecosystems that supports us. It's our life support. We're part of nature. We depend on nature. We can't afford to wipe it out or we're going to wipe ourselves out. So we got a global crisis here. The good news is it's got a grassroots solution. It's something that you and I can address immediately. There are four things that every landscape has to, four ecological goals that every landscape has to accomplish if it's going to achieve a sustainable relationship with the natural world. It's got to capture carbon that's going to help that, that climate change issue. It's got to manage the watershed that it's in. It's got to support a diverse community of pollinators. Not because they pollinate a third of our crops. It's really about a twelfth of our crops. It's because they pollinate 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. If we lost our pollinators, we'd lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet, and that is not an option. And every landscape has to support a complex food web. In other words, the plants in that landscape have to pass on part of their energy so that we have animals that run the ecosystems we depend on. When you plant an oak, you are addressing three out of those four major ecological goals. That tree is going to capture more carbon, it's going to manage the watershed better, and it's going to support a more complex food web than any other tree genus in the country. The only thing it's not going to do better than other, other plants is support a diverse community of pollinators because oaks are wind pollinated. But three out of four is pretty good. Despite all these wonderful landscape attributes, our oaks uh, are, are in trouble. We've lost the giants. We haven't lost them. We've cut them down. We've cut down the giants that used to be common in our, our forest because, of course, that was, that was an easy source of wood and they were in the way of farming. 
The percentage of oaks in our eastern forest has been cut in half in the last hundred years because we've suppressed forest fires, which favor oaks. Uh, and we've introduced a lot of problems, a number of oak diseases like oak wilt and uh, bacterial leaf scorch and pests like the gypsy moth. Um, we fragmented our, our oak populations to the point where now many oaks, they can't, uh, the pollen can't reach other oaks. So we have, have much poorer uh, acorn set than we used to have. For all of those reasons, there are 28 of the 91 North American oak species that are now threatened. We're not the only ones doing this. It's happening all over the world. One third of our global oaks are endangered. The Oregon white oak, for example, used to grow from central California all the way up through Washington state as less 97% of its range because it was, it's where it grew was where uh, it's best for agriculture. There are 2,300 species that rely on oaks in Great Britain that are threatened because of the loss of oaks in Great Britain. You know, we humans live our life out in a very brief instant of ecological time, and we can't return the giant oak trees to our forest during that time period, but we can start the process. And in no time at all, the oaks that we plant today will become big enough to fulfill most of their keystone ecological roles in, in our landscapes. Everybody on the planet is responsible for good earth stewardship because everybody on the planet requires healthy ecosystems. So the best way to express your responsibility uh, towards, towards our stewardship is to embrace the power of oaks. So for the sake of our turkeys, our chickadees, our woodpeckers, our, our warblers, our jays, our thrushes, our emeralds, our prominents, our gallers, our weevils, our orthopterans, and even us. Plant an oak, plant a living community, plant the future. Thanks very much. Oh, thank you so much, Doug. That was just a wonderful presentation as always. Um, we do have questions. Uh, people have been adding them all through your talk and I will start with the first one, if you're ready. Are you I'm ready? ready. For okay. Um, so Kim says, on the acorn producing asynchronicity between species, uh, asynchronicity between species. This sounds very similar to the emergence of cicada species being asynchronous. Do individual species have their own fixed lengths of masting cycles or is it variable by individual? Um, uh, <laughs> there's nothing predictable about masting. So if you have a mass one year, you're not going to be able to say, well, in five years, we'll have another one. There's so many factors that go into it, and we're not sure what it is. Certainly weather is important. So if you have, if it's rainy when the uh, oak catkins are out, or if you have a late freeze and it, you know, affects the pollen production, that will affect a lot of species of oaks simultaneously, even if they all wanted to mass that year. Um, but the, the, oh, the mass that we had in 2019 went from Massachusetts to Georgia, almost all the way to the Mississippi, and most of the members of the red oak group that spanned too many weather systems. So it wasn't just weather synchronicity that created that mass. Um, and it's unpredictable. We don't know when the next one will, will be. Sometimes there's several species that do it at once. Sometimes it's just one, which means I cannot answer your question. Yeah, and I, that's probably to the benefit of the oaks from what you were saying. I mean, yeah. To, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, did our, now I'm not sure if she's, referring to the ice storms that we had here in Memphis uh, very recently, but it says, did, the, did our recent ice slash wind storms impact acorns falling off and trees toppling? Well, it wouldn't have impacted, eh, I shouldn't say that. Red oak acorns uh, uh, stay on the tree for 18 months. So it could have impacted uh, those. But um, most of the white oak group produce their acorns in one year, and the, they haven't flowered yet during the winter time. So there's, it's not going to knock any acorns off there. Oaks are pretty tough, so yes, ice can can you know break limbs, but it's going to break other limbs first. So oaks usually withstand storms like that uh, more more than other types of trees, particularly conifers. Conifers really get clobbered. Yeah. Okay, um, I have a tiny oak. I found it in my yard and deer keep eating all the leaves. How do I save it? Yeah. Uh, 
Well, you got, you have to cage it. You have to cage it. If I don't cage my oaks when they're young, I don't have oaks. The deer will kill your oak. The deer will kill almost anything. We have an overabundance of deer from coast to coast, and they are making restoration really, really hard. Uh, so um, what I do is was get a five foot tall galvanized wire cage at, at Lowe's or Home Depot. Uh, you get a roll of it. It's not very expensive. And make a healthy circle of that, that cage. You just put it around the oak, even when it's little, so that it can grow and expand its branches. I see people wrap their trees and they do little teeny circles like this and the trees like this and it comes out all distorted. Give the, the tree some, some space. I know they're ugly. But um, you can't, they do grow past the point where deer will, will hurt them. And, and I call that graduation. Then I can pull the tree, the cage off. The cages that I built when we moved in, in the year 2000, I'm still using them. So they, they last forever and you can move them around. And, and uh, um, other than caging out the deer in your entire property, I don't have a solution. Well, the real solution is to reduce deer numbers. That's that's a bigger thing than than you can do alone. But we really, as as a culture, for the sake of our forests, for the sake of Lyme disease, for the sake of the deer themselves, and for the sake of invasive species, deer are encouraging the uh, they're tipping the competitive balance against our native plants. They love the native plants. They won't eat the the bush honeysuckle or the the privet or the other things. And so all of a sudden, that's all you have left. That's devastating to the local biodiversity. So for all of those reasons, we've got to get deer populations under control. Um, our next question is uh, pretty similar to the last. What is the best way to protect young oaks while they are growing? So I guess I'm wondering if you have anything to add to your previous answer. You know, they do spell, sell sprays or you can make sprays that you spray in the foliage that will make the leaves distasteful to oaks probably also makes it distasteful to the insects that you're trying to, to help, but um, you can do that. You got to do it every time it rains. I got tired of doing that real fast. If you have a single tree you're trying to protect and you don't want to use a, a, a spray, then, uh, or you don't want to use a cage, then, then maybe you can try to spray. Okay. Um, are you saying not to rake away the leaf litter at all? What about mulching with your lawnmower? Well, you're chopping up all the cocoons that are in there. It's better than, than raking the leaves away because at least the nutrients are in those tree, in those leaves. But when you chop them up, it also shortens the lifespan of those leaves. So they're not lasting long enough or they may not last long enough to cover the ground all year long. And that's, that's what you need. So yes, I am essentially saying don't rake the leaves away from under your tree. But one thing I didn't talk about, I, I do in other talks, is the need to make beds under all of our trees. Not just our oaks, but everything. Because when the caterpillars drop from the trees to pupate, they've got to get underground um, or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that's under the tree. So if we have grass right up to the tree, it become, the ground becomes really compacted and caterpillar survivorship really drops off. So it's a good place to make beds, put your, your uh, ground covers like uh, foam flower or may apple or wild ginger. And then the leaf litter nestles down underneath those. Uh, and, and so you don't have to look at it if you think it's ugly. Plants are a wonderful ground cover. Um, and you can then you can put uh, uh, blueberries and, and dogwoods. You can have a three-dimensional landscape under your trees. You don't want to put a plant under your oak tree that requires abnormal amounts of watering because uh, if your oak is, is a species that doesn't want a lot, of, a lot of water, you can actually kill it that way. This is more of a feature of the West where people will do that. But um, that's the way to maintain your, your, uh, the leaves on your property. I like to think of the leaf litter on our property the way we think of water now. We understand that all the rain that, that falls on a given property should stay on that property so that it infiltrates and we recharge the water table and we don't have storm water runoff. I'm saying the same thing for, for the leaves that fall. They should all stay in your property somewhere. Yes, we can't leave them on the lawn, but I wanna have less lawn. I wanna reduce the area of lawn by, by 50%. My son bought a house uh, a couple of years ago, a new house. And in the fall, he called me up and he said, uh, he said, dad, I've got too many leaves. What should I do with my leaves? And I said, rake them in your flower beds. He said, I don't have enough flower beds. I said, exactly. 
<laughs> Make more flower beds. That's how you reduce your lawn, and that's what you do with your leaves. <laughs> okay. Um, I have noticed lots of galls on the ground after the wind and ice storm. Is this beneficial or harmful to the environment? Well, you know, the, the, the galls that are on twigs um, stay there for essentially the life, life of the tree or the life of that twig, even though the galler is long gone, it's only there uh, you know, until it, till it emerges. It, the gall becomes a woody structure and those twigs, a lot of them uh, can die back. So what you're seeing is the pruning of old gall material that's, that's not, not living. Let me just make a, a quick comment. I got, got a, I guess it was an, an email from people in, in St. Louis this week they're having a big problem with the horned oak gall, uh, particularly on pin oaks, where they're, you know, pin oaks are getting clobbered by the horned oak gall. Uh, so, I, so they've done two things. They planted only pin oaks. So you've got this, this massive amount of food that this particular galler wants, unlimited amount of food. So of course the populations explode. But the other thing they're doing is of course spraying for mosquitoes. And that kills the natural enemies that control the, the horned oak gall. So um, again, it's, it's our inputs without thinking about the consequences. Mosquito fogging doesn't just kill mosquitoes. It doesn't kill enough mosquitoes to control mosquitoes, so they have to fog over and over again, but it does kill all those natural enemies and, and the caterpillars and everything else that are non-targets. And then you get pests. So stop your mosquito spraying and you'll have fewer galls. <laughs> That's really interesting. Um, so we sh sh so should we not allow lawn services to spray trees for bugs? Does it harm? You should birds? not. Your trees do not need to be sprayed. That's exactly right. As a matter of fact, the <sighs> way the lawn service operates today, there's nothing ecologically sound about it. I want to retrain these folks so that they understand um, how to create an ecologically functional landscape. What plants should they use? How do you maintain them? I don't want them to lose their jobs. I just want them to do, do it right. The mow, blow and go guys that are just there to, to fertilize when your lawn doesn't need it, to pollute our, our, our aquifers, to put poisons everywhere when you don't need it, that's not good for anybody. And then you get to pay them for that. So let's restructure this whole, whole industry to call them ecological landscapers. Most people don't garden. Most people just hire somebody. And I want you to be able to hire somebody, but I want you to be able to hire somebody to, to um, <laughs> promote life in the future instead of killing everything. With you there, for sure. Um, here's another question. Are there other butterflies other than the banded hair streak that use oaks? There's several species of, of hair streaks that, that use oaks. Um, but in general, very few other butterflies do. Uh, there is a, the great purple hair streak is a specialist on the mistletoe that is on oaks. Uh, so if you're in an area of the country, um, and, and it, this includes the South, but particularly the Southwest up through California, there's a lot of mistletoe on oaks. That's what the great purple hair streak uh, uh, depends on. But most butterflies do use other plants. It's the moths that really love the oaks. The, again, 952 species of, of moths on oaks in North America. That's amazing. <clears throat> okay, and then I, I think I I'm going to read this. Uh, it's mainly a comment um, about the use of non-native plants. So this is on our uh, local utilities website. They have a trade a tree program and they're offering to replace a removed tree with one of six low height varieties, which won't interfere with power lines. And the customers are offered the choice of a Bradford pear, crepe myrtle, foster holly, fatinia, um, weeping privet, or Japanese maple. Those are the choices. <laughs> well, there, there, the, the, question the, is, the question is, are any of these options native to Tennessee? And if not, what can we, Basically, can we connect the trade to tree program with some native options? Yes, of course you can. None of them are, are native to anywhere in the US. Bradford pear is one of the most invasive plants we have. Um, St. Louis, Fayetteville, Arkansas, South Carolina, North Carolina have bounties on them. You take out a, a calorie pear or a Bradford pear, you get a free tree replacement. 
they're banned from sale in Delaware and Massachusetts and some other places. It's, a, it's an absolutely horrible choice. Privet, you have millions of acres covered with invasive privet in, this, in the Southeast. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's inconscionable, is that the word? You know what I mean? To be selling these things or giving them away. These are ecological tumors that are castrating the function of our natural areas. Those plants will not stay on any plant property that you plant them. Do we have short native plants? Of course we do. How about witch hazel? How about any of the viburnums? Um, how about how about carpinus, uh, ironwood? There's plenty of, of sure thing. How about the, the dwarf chestnut oak? It's not gonna interfere with your power lines. Those would be responsible. Uh, or, or any of the dogwoods. Those would be responsible recommendations for under power lines. Um, I guess it's appropriate if I mentioned the National Wildlife Federation uh, website, perhaps, and the, where you can search a list of native plant options using your zip code, I think. Isn't that right? Yes, that is right. Of course, they're not ranked by height. <laughs> they're, oh, they're ranked by how, how uh, much life they support. So, Okay, thank you. Okay, well, I think, let me make sure. Uh-oh, here's more. Here's another question. Um, just two more and then we're going to be done. Okay, what are the best types of oaks that you would recommend for the Mid-South? Well, uh, again, it, it depends on your particular property. There are oaks that like acid soil. There are oaks that like basic soil. There are oaks that like their feet wet, like the water oak or the, or the pin oak or the, the swamp white oak. There are oaks that like dry, rocky outcrops like chestnut oak or, or white oak. So it depends on the conditions where you actually are. And it depends on the size of your property. If you have a fair-sized property, plant one of the big guys. Let it get up there and spread and, and, and do a lot of good. But, you know, if you're in, a, in a, a smaller suburban lot, plant one of the small ones. I always go back to, to Quercus prinoides, although you guys can plant Georgia oak too without any, any problem. Um, or the, the dwarf... I don't know, can, can live oaks live in Memphis? Are you too far north? I think we're too far north. Yeah, okay. I'm not a horticulturist, but I think so. Okay, last question. Can oaks hybridize? I've been told that hybridized oaks are still fertile and can further hybridize. So what percentage of oaks are hybrids? You are correct. Oaks hybridize readily within uh, a taxonomic group. So white oaks will hybridize with other the white oak group will hybridize with other members of the white oak group. Red oak group hybridizes with other members of the red oak group. Um, and they, they hybridize much more frequently than other, other members of a plant genus do. And many of the hybrids are fertile. So you're correct. And some of those hybrids are so stable that they actually have uh, names been given to them. Um, so what that suggests is that oaks are really closely related to each other. And that's why the hybrids can be fertile. It's also one of the reasons that so many things can do well on oaks because the leaf chemistry is so similar. If you adapt to one oak, you can, you can eat most of the oaks. Mm -hmm. uh, but yep, oaks, oaks hybridize, I don't know, maybe more than any other tree genus. I'll just say that without really knowing the answer to that. But. <laughs> <laughs> Someone has, uh, Bill, thank you, he's written in that says we do have some healthy live oaks here in Memphis. So okay. All right. Good. So, yeah. So um, thank you everyone for your wonderful questions. And thank you, Doug, for another wonderful presentation. I enjoy every talk you've ever give, given. I've listened to you many times. And um, well, so thank you. thank you very much for joining us. Um, everyone, we are recording this presentation and in about a week, if you've registered for the program, you'll get a link. So you can watch this all again if you'd like. Um, I want to remind you we're doing a tree planting day uh, right after Arbor Day on March 5th. So we'll be potting up some bare root uh, oak seedlings, eight species of oaks, and a couple of other types of trees, which will only stay in the, po the pots a little time before they go out on a permanent site and get to <laughs> develop those uh, big Good. root systems. Make them. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Doug, very much. Take care. Bye.